This is a show about my heroes and their legacies. The legacies they're making and the ones they're breaking. These are their stories of successes and failures. These are their journeys. This is their legacy. This is Successor. My name is Evan Payne and welcome to The Successor Podcast, a show dedicated to making and breaking legacies. I sit down with entrepreneurs, business leaders, foundation leaders, entertainers, and many more to learn how they are making impactful changes, not only in their industries, but in the world. This podcast is dedicated to those of you seeking purpose by pl- plugging into some of my heroes who have found theirs. And speaking of heroes of mine, Sue Bidstrup. So glad, glad to have you. Sue Bidstrup is the founder of Great Big Yes Coaching and Community. She is a writer and a life coach who focuses on helping women begin and sustain a journaling practice. She's worn several hats over the years, including hosting a podcast, creating and facilitating an online coaching group, speaking to women's organizations, teaching Christian yoga, and serving in many different ministries. Her first book, Great Big Yes, Stories of God's Grace, was published this fall. You can find her at greatbigyes.com and follow her on her on social media at her handle at great big yes sue and her family live in the hill country outside of austin texas sue welcome it's so glad to have you thank you for having me evan i'm so glad to be here did i say it's so glad to have you that's how excited <laughs> i am to have you i am so glad to have you and uh, i've been looking forward to it uh, sue is a, a longtime friend and uh, and so yeah w- welcome here um thank you let's let's get started by talking about great big yes because i dove into this myself and uh i i got hooked uh, oh, good. because i, I love the, the phrasing the way that you talk the the um the way that you uh you know use sentence structure is very similar to mine so i just mm-hmm. kept reading and reading and reading and so it's very natural i love that um so let's talk about uh what great big yes is kind of what it's what its purpose is okay awesome um all right so great big yes started as a blog in 2010 And I named it Great Big Yes because I wanted to write about God and faith kind of from the mother perspective, like it was kind of the mommy blogging years. (laughs) Um, And so my kids were little, but I wanted to talk about faith in a way that was relatable. I've always had that desire. That's always felt like a calling for me is to speak about faith in a way that people can relate to and encourage people to seek out God on their own. Mm. Um, And so Great Big Yes is saying yes to God. So it's like the big yes of your life, the overarching yes, right? Because we all have little bitty yeses, right? Like, you know, and they're not small, but like who to marry, you know, where to work, what we want to do with our lives, how to raise our kids. There's all these different yeses in our lives. But if our overarching big yes is to God, that's going to direct our path in our life. And so Mm -hmm. that's why I named it Great Big Yes. And then I wrote essays once a week on the blog for years. And then I ended up um, doing a lot of other things throughout the years, because it's been, gosh, 13 years um, of this. But when I wrote the book, um, I had to name it Great Big Yes, because that's just been the name. And so I was so excited. What the book is, is just kind of a collection of all those essays that I've written over those years. Um, Some were edited out, and then I added some as well. And so the point of the book is to get people thinking about their own stories and seeing God's hand in their lives Mm -hmm. and seeing the divine threads throughout their life when they look back. And so journaling has helped me do that and writing and the blog has helped me do that. And so I wanna help people do that in their own lives. So when I write the essay in the book, then I also include three journaling prompts for you to start writing your own story. That's really cool. And and that's something that I enjoyed. One of the things that I, um, starting this podcast, I had a challenge uh, with with explaining is kind of what is it what does it mean when people come on and tell their story, right? Yeah. What does it mean when you sit down and you try to plan out or write out what is it I want my legacy to be, right? Yeah. And this is even what you're doing is even you know more personal and, and more precise, and 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 it's um, it seems like it it has the opportunity to bring a lot of healing. Yes, I well. hope so. Yeah. I hope so. I think through journaling through. I had my own Christian therapist for a long time, and she helped me start um, using journaling as a way to kind of ask God, God, what's next, or what do you want for me, or what do you want me to learn here? Hmm. And so I got some clarity through that, and um, healing, like you said, healing. And so that's why I really want to encourage other people to do it. When you sit down to write, it's, you know, 
you mentioned, I've been a Christian yoga teacher. And one of the things that I um, learned through that practice is that mindfulness and just taking that time to breathe and be still. And journaling offers that as well. Mm -hmm. Because you sit down and you've got a blank piece of paper and a pen. And if you pray beforehand and you say, God, what do you want me to write? What Mm. what do you want to bring up for me? What do you want to heal in me? What do you want to teach me? Um, It's just a really powerful practice. And I think a lot of times I have coaching clients that are so surprised by what God brought up for them that they're like, I can't believe this is what I wrote. Mm. And a lot of times it's just really poignant and um, it's beautiful practice. So I'm excited to share it with people. I love that. You know, I, I... Personally, have have always had a challenge when it comes to going through studies and, and journaling and actually wanting to write things out. And it, it struck me that that this actually motivated me to want oh, to good. write things down. I was like, okay, she she tugged <laughs> at some heartstrings here, and okay, now I want to talk about it. Good, right? good. Uh, so it was, it was it was really cool. Yeah, it offers a really, I mean, unique perspective into you know being able to be introspective, right? Yes. And, you know, it's a unique view into myself. Was, yes. was kind of what it <laughs> yes. sounded like. For sure. So. Let's talk about, you know, you said it kind of started with, with mommy blogging, right, in kind of the 2010s. But I, I'd love to know, because there's there are so many um, references and allusions to your past and your yeah. upbringing throughout the book, uh, what kind of what kind of brought you to the practice of writing and, and journaling and, and finding that being an outlet? Yeah. So I mentioned um, my therapist asking me to journal, but it started way, way before then. Like when I was younger, I always had journals. I always wrote. Remember those composition books you would have in college? Just the black and white, right? So I have tons of those just filled um, with stories of my life. And, you know, even just little diaries that used to have the lock on them when we were little. um, And they'd be like pink and furry, but they'd have a lock and you'd hide it. And it would be this special place that you would write things. Um, I always did all of that. And so I have stacks and stacks of journals from the past. And I love to go buy a new journal. So I have a lot. And I think the audience will understand this. A lot of times you buy the journal because you think it looks great. And you have all (laughs) these great plans. And you write like a couple days in it. And then you don't write in it again. And then you find that later. And you're like, oh, my goodness, I meant to do this. And you start again. So I understand that the practice can be some seasons you're not going to want to write everything down, right? Um, But if it becomes like a, a... practice that you commit yourself to, kind of like working out or praying or studying scripture. If you have this time that you write, maybe it's five minutes a day. Um, Some people like to brain dump, they call it, like at the end of the day, just like write everything down before they go to sleep, kind of just giving themselves that opportunity to like, you know, better out than in, right? Like, don't worry about it, put it on paper. Um, There's something really cathartic about that. So I started writing um, when I was younger. My parents owned a bookstore. um, And so I've been reading and writing um, my whole life. And so the dream to write a book is, you know, from years of unpacking books as they came into the store and going to book fairs and um, just always having books. Like a lot of people like electronic books. They'll go get the ebook. Um, I like actual books, like in my hand that I can smell. <laughs> I know it's weird <laughs> when you're at a library and you can like smell the books. That's so good to me. Um, or an old bookstore, an old time bookstore. So um, yeah, just reading and writing has always been a thing for me. It's always just, it, it's an escape, but it's also a place where you find, I think, revelation and transformation. I think that you can learn so much from people who have written through the years. So that's, that's very cool. And you know, it's funny you talk about composition books. I literally have a stack of them underneath this desk. Oh, really? That I, that I'm, I don't even want to open up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how many bad ideas are yeah. in there? Um, but, you know, you, you talk a little bit about um, uh, the the idea of saying yes to God, right? The, it's not yeah. just an idea, the practice of yeah, saying yes to God. Practice. And, um, you know, I, uh, another person I admire whom I've not yet met, uh, though I've, I'm sure if I asked, he would say yes, but Bob Goff, right? Yes. Talk, you know, talks a I lot about, him. you know, love does, right? And yes. the action of saying yes. Uh, this is a little bit of, of a curveball, and I didn't, I didn't, you know, send this question your way, but uh, I'd love to just understand what. Were there any experiences in in your life specifically that really tugged on your heart to start saying yes or start giving those, you know, start giving God a chance in in more parts of your life? Yeah. Well, um, I I was raised um, in church, but I was raised Catholic. And um, when I was a teenager, and this is in the book, but when I was a teenager, someone had asked me about my faith and asked me if I was going to heaven. And I was like, 
yeah. You know, he's like, why? I'm like, well, I'm a good person. You know, <laughs> like, I didn't know. Um, and that just kind of sent me on a, a quest. And um, I always had a mom and dad who really lived their faith. They, they just showed it through who they were, very kind um, people with integrity. And so I always knew that I wanted those values. And then just kind of the more I learned about God, it was kind of a slow um, learning and, and searching for me. And that's why I write about that in the book, because I think that sometimes we come as adults and we might meet people that have a strong faith and, and we feel almost ashamed that we don't. Mm. Or we feel that maybe we weren't raised the right way or we didn't understand it in the right way or we didn't do enough. You know, we kind of start judging ourselves. And what I want people to do and see through this book is just we all have a journey and they all look different. And God's in all of it. Hmm. He's in all of it. There's no reason. Like, I I believe that the path that I had through my childhood and who my parents were and all of that, it's all God's plan. And so when you start from a place of acceptance and and trust in God that he got it right, right. Um, then you, you can start to say to yourself, okay, I didn't get it wrong. Hmm. I may not be exactly where I want to be yet, but if I start saying yes now and I continue to say yes to where God's leading me, then I'm going to... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with him. It's not this perfect thing where we get to this place and we go, okay, now I'm just fully, you know, I'm so godly, right? Mm-hmm. It's a practice. And I think we've said that word like four times already today. Right. But I think that's really a great theme. The writing is a practice. Faith is a practice, you know? People say you practice your religion, right? right, right. I don't like the word religion because I think that conjures up rules. And we talk about that a lot at our church, right? It's a relationship with Jesus. You're a Christ follower. But I think that the more you say yes, then you start to trust and you say, oh, okay, let's do that again, Lord. Like, this is fun. You mentioned Bob Goff. The reason why he's so compelling and so he's fun. Mm -hmm. He's fun. He's filled with joy. And I I tried to bring that, that out in the book. And I think sometimes Christians can seem really maybe a little bit serious or, you know, it depends, right? Who you're, who you're reading or who you're listening to. Um, but I wanted it to also be funny and fun and relatable because that's how life is. And that's the way I choose to look at life. And so um, when there's writers who are joyful like that, um, I also love them because I'm like, yeah, you know, this, this should be fun because it's an adventure. And once you start saying yes, you just want to say yes. You're like, what, what's next? This is so cool. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's a um, that's a that's a really neat um, you know. Well, I say perspective. It's 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 your book, right? It's, it's your perspective. Um, but kind of funny. I was I was sitting there. We, we had we had a moment uh, a few weeks ago. The, the family and I were, were all sitting there reading in silence. That's never happened. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, maybe one or two people reading, but we were all just like, okay, let's just put aside everything else and just read. And I picked up your book. <laughs> I had to be so annoying because every every three or four minutes, I just start chuckling or laughing oh, out loud, belly laughing, and kind of getting these looks at the side. Good. I love <laughs> so, that. That so, makes me happy. And I yeah, think because too. you know me, you probably read it. A lot of people that know me have said, it's so cool to read because it's like you're talking right. and you can hear my voice. And, you know, you mentioned kind of the style it's written. I had a professional editor and we had a long talk about um, there's there were things in there that were chosen that were stylistic choices, mm. meant to sound like conversation. But if she was going to be grammatically correcting it, like that, that's a run-on sentence there. But we kept it mm. because I was really adamant that it sounded approachable and relatable and fun and like you're having a coffee with your best friend mm. versus it being some, you know, me preaching. Because it's never about me being right or knowing everything it's more about like this is my journey i want to share it with you now let's take a look at yours like isn't this fun isn't this interesting you know um it's to get curious and i I always say it starts with curiosity and then it ends in celebration Hmm. because you're going to be gratitude's going to come to you when you start to look for the divine threads because they're there and they're in everybody's life because god loves us all Hmm. You, you brought to mind kind of um you know, I haven't been doing this terribly long podcasting, but even my first one, the number of times that I went in, I was like, oh, I need to edit the way that sounds or the way it feels or, you know, just, and, and by the end of it, it was unrecognizable, right? Because That's I had right. taken myself out of it. That's right. Right. And so the, 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 the choice to leave in the mistakes and leave in the, you know, the, the genuine nature of, yes. of having conversation yes. um, is, is, is so important. Uh, you know, just to, to zoom in on one more thing, you talk about 
practice and uh, and you talk about the um, about if you're going to say yes to God, right? That means that you have to trust that you're actually hearing His voice, right? You have a uh, peace about that, yes. right? You're centered on that. Um, a thing that I that I in, enjoy about the book too um, is is that it seems to kind of draw a circle around. Uh, you know, g- getting the getting the the reader into a space of really reflect on this, mm-hmm. really reflect on how what your experience has been with this and where peace is is leading you. Right? Yeah, and and that's been that's something that kind of stood out to me as well Good. because you know if, if you're if you're following in peace, you're usually following the right path. You that's know, right. That's that's, you that's, know, that's my feeling. I believe that if it comes from God, it comes with clarity and not chaos. Mm. Mm. And so I think when you start to realize, when you start to write, you start to see like where where am I feeling chaotic and ah, <laughs> or where am I like you know writing out? It's more peaceful. There's like a bodily sense of peace as well, right? There's a mind thing about peace, but you can feel it in your body, right? We know mm-hmm. that if we've ever suffered from anxiety, which I have, and it's in the book, but it talks about how um, you know your body is having a reaction, and you can tell it this isn't real. And it's still happening. And so how do we get our body and our mind and our soul all like kind of linked up for that peace, that true peace, right, that um, incorporates all of us? And that, again, I think it's so fascinating the way that God has brought me on my journey and that yoga was part of it when a lot of Christians weren't doing yoga and a lot of Christians didn't like that I was doing yoga, but I was doing Christian yoga where we would worship and we would study scripture and all of that. But that mind-body connection Mm. is huge. Journaling's the same way, mind-body connection, because you're actually writing. And that's why a lot of people say to me, Sue, can I just type it out on my computer? I'm like, no. (laughs) You need to take the pen in your hand and write it out. There's something about that. You know, my daughter Mm. suffered from um, dyslexia. And so she totally, um, she doesn't even really, she wouldn't show up as having dyslexia anymore because she went through so much training with great people. And it was all about the multi-sensory approach to learning, right? So she would be hearing something and writing it or maybe taking her finger in like um, shaving cream (laughs) or sand, right? There was this bodily thing that she was doing at the same time when she was learning something and then it stuck. And how cool that way of teaching is. And that's just kind of, I think, what happens when you're writing um, or when you're, a lot of times people say they have revelations from God when they're walking or when they're running hmm. or when they're exercising, whatever their exercise is, biking. Um, because I think that he uses all of us. He uses our body to show us too. You know, you can feel something feels heavy or you can feel something feels light, right? right. And that's a big uh, sign for me. I think we need to pay attention to that as well. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. And I want, I want to shift gears just a little bit because as much as I want to go into every single you know detail of the book, I also <laughs> want people to go out and you know buy it and yes. uh, enjoy it. Uh, I, I don't know if you if you designed the book for 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 dudes, but uh, anyway, we're enjoying it's for it. Everybody. <laughs> it's for everybody. A lot of women have said, "I gave it to my husband and he loved it," or "My husband loved this essay," or "I read this out loud." So yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, let, let's step over into the uh, kind of the. the the built business realm, right? Because yeah. going from um, your know, great big yes as a you know as as a as a podcast and a blog and 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 now as a book, um, what what sort of learning curves uh, would you say were most um, prevalent or maybe maybe made the cause the biggest shifts in, in either your 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 thought process on on what you were doing yeah. or on on just kind of how the business should should carry forward. Yeah, I thought about this question because I think it's really interesting because I ended up having a coaching group that was women entrepreneurs. And um, the women that I coached were all starting a business, but a lot of them were starting a business that had to do with something they felt um, was their calling or their purpose in life. And so what I realized is one of the roadblocks for people who are kingdom minded is they hate asking for money. And so a lot of times your business sense isn't (laughs) as honed. And so you end up um, doing a lot of things for free, which leads to a lot of conversations with my husband about like, what's the ROI on this? (laughs) Um, So for me personally in making it a business, because it was a blog for years. And then when I got my coaching certificate, um, I started, I kind of hung up my shingle and I'm like, all right, I want to do this. This is the business. And you kind of start charging money. And then you realize people need to pay something to have a hundred percent 
um, commitment to it. Mm. I've realized that. So it's it's not wrong to ask for money, but there is sort of this sense of kind of mixing, um, is this ministry or is this business? So for me, that's been something that's um, challenging. Mm. And even with the book, I just kind of want to go and like give it to everyone because I'm hoping that it inspires them. Um, and so I do a lot of that. So it's finding that balance between what's ministry and what's business. Um Learning curve. I mean, you and I talked a little bit about how much you have to learn to do a podcast. Hmm. I mean, I did that. What I realized is that I love learning, and so I'm constantly doing something new. So as it st- it started as a blog, then I became a yoga teacher. You know, then I started a podcast. Then I wrote a book, became a coach, had an online coaching community. <laughs> I ended up coaching people on like how to do Instagram, which I was just saying right. I can always help with that. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of always wanted it to be new and wanted there to be sort of a learning curve because I I think I'm just that personality. I get kind of bored. I'm like, what are we doing next? You know? Um, But the book was always kind of overarching the whole thing. I was like, I really want to do this. I really want to do this. I really want to do this. And so business-wise for writing a book, um, I met with a traditional publisher. That was a huge learning curve. Like what is the difference between traditional publishing and what is the difference, you know, what is self-publishing? Um, I can talk for days about that. I Meeting with a publisher, you realize they really want you to have such a big audience already that they can guarantee 10,000 books will sell. And they say that it's 5% of your email list that they would say is guaranteed to buy. So if you need 10,000 to be 5% of your email list, you need a really large email list. Wow. And so that really wasn't the route that was going to work for me. I really wanted to do it quickly. A traditional publisher is going to take up to two years from acquisition to when they publish. So I wanted it right away. I wanted to dedicate it to my mom. I wanted her to have it. I wanted um, it just to be now. I wanted it now. Um, (laughs) Also, um, you and I talked about it sounding conversational and it sounding real and it flowing. Um, traditional publishers wanted to edit out a lot of things, a um, uh, lot of things. The things that I didn't even understand why. I was like, tell me why that word's not okay, right? It, it wasn't a swear word. It was just a word. Um, and so you go through this learning period of like, you think you want something, and then you find that there's probably going to be this other path that you're going to take to get that thing. So the overarching thing was I knew I wanted to write this book. I wanted it to honor God and I wanted it to encourage people. And I found some no's from the traditional publishing world. And instead of like taking to my bed and deciding I wasn't meant to write a book, um, I just kept praying over it. I kept writing it. I kept moving forward. I got the designer. I got the editor, all of that. And I just self-published it. Mm-hmm. And So for me, that was like a major learning curve because I thought there was one way to do something. Mm. And I realized there's lots of ways, (laughs) lots of ways to do it. And that's why I want to encourage people too, if they're trying to do something, whether it's a podcast or a book or whatever they're trying to do, I always tell people action brings clarity, right? And you get this, just start. (laughs) Because so many, I I call it procrastinate planning. So many people are like, well, I'll do it when I have this or when you know when i have a big business plan when i have more money when i have a better studio when i have you know a a deal with a publisher whatever it is no if you want to be a writer write if you want to be a podcaster podcast it will come it the next step will become clear kind of as you go action is going to bring clarity but if you just sit there and wait you're never going to do anything Hmm. um so I don't know. I feel like I just talked a long time, but that's a lot of lessons. That's a lot of <laughs> yes. lessons I've learned for sure. <laughs> Perfect. No, that's exactly what I'm, I was looking for. Thank you. Um, and and so these aren't these aren't just questions, you know, just to to please an audience. These are questions that I've been wondering for yeah. some time, and I finally get the chance to sit down and ask you. So yeah, everybody's experiencing this with me for the Good. first time. <laughs> Good. Well, I feel like there's so many ways we could go. Right. Like I I talked to somebody the other day for a long time just about publishing. You know, and she was super interested in that. And, you know, um, then there's like the even just the practice of writing, right? So there's all these ways it could go. So thank you. I love that you're kind of touching on everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as far as um, stepping, putting on the, the, the life coaching uh, hat, uh, what are some, what are some principles um, that, that you want to communicate to, to somebody who is, who's stepping into that, especially for, for 
maybe the first time. Yeah. Uh, what are some things that are maybe, what are some principles that are most applicable or, or, or that you find most useful? Not not to give away, you know, your entire playbook here, yeah. but what are some things that are, that are top priority? Yeah. So one of the things that I think is really important that people understand about coaching versus therapy, because this comes up a lot, mm. um, coaching is really about the future. Mm. And therapy, a lot of times you're going into your past. You're trying to kind of figure something out or why you feel a certain way or what happened in your childhood. Um, so as a coach, we don't do any of that. Mm. And if it starts to get into that, we have to say um, – you know, that feels like maybe something you would want to talk to a therapist about. So coaching is like taking somebody who's pretty healthy, like ready to do something, like ready to move forward, right? And so my question is always, where do you want to be? What do you want to, who do you want to be? And we kind of look at where you want to be, where you are now, and how we're going to get there. Mm. And so it can be about planning. It can be about time management. It can be about scheduling. Um, it can be about finding where you want to be or who you want to be because maybe they don't know. Um, and then a big question is, okay, here's where you want to be and here's how we plan to do it. What's going to get in the way? Hmm. And you realize sometimes people have never considered what their roadblocks are, what their obstacles are. And then that uncovers a lot of things like, oh, well, I'm going to say I don't have enough money or I'm going to say, um, you know, uh, it's too hard. <laughs> mm. You know, it's just too hard. I, that is so common. It's hard. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you and I talked about that a little bit earlier. It's hard to start something new, but it's also um, worth it. And so just talking to people about where they want to go and and helping them get there and encouraging them. I mean, most people need encouragement. They need to know they're not crazy for their idea. Uh, and if I think it's crazy <laughs> or like it's like, whoa, um, we can kind of talk through that and they can kind of explain where they are and what they want to do and why they want to do it and how they came to this. Um, but it's really my job to just ask questions and let them figure it out. So there's no agenda as a mm -hmm. coach. You're like um, listening. I have a little um, post-it because I love to talk. I have a post-it <laughs> on my um, computer. It says wait. And it says and it stands for why am I talking? Mm -hmm. And uh, like in a situation like this, I love it because I'm supposed to talk. <laughs> um, but in coaching, I'm really not supposed to talk too much. So it's like you get um, probably about five questions that you're going to ask in an hour session um, because that's really for the client to talk. And as they talk, they figure it out. And then in between sessions, um, they're journaling, hopefully. Um, they're doing their homework. And then they come back and they're like, whoa, you know what I realized? And then they get excited about that. So. That's neat. Um, I, you brought up a couple things uh, along the way that that um, struck me. Um, planning and preparing for obstacles, right? That's something that that's something that when we go off and we do something on our own, if we, if we if we haven't talked to somebody who's maybe been there before, or mm -hmm. done it, done it before, we we leave out that entire avenue of planning for obstacles mm -hmm. and 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 I'll, I'll say that the things that i've done on, alone or or that i've uh, the projects i've taken on on my own and without bringing any out in any uh, bringing in any outside expertise um those have been those obstacles have been devastating yep. to my forward progress mm -hmm. because i'm like well hang on why is this happening mm -hmm. why is this happening now why is this happening to me does this happen to everybody? I wouldn't know because I haven't talked to anybody. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I find right. that that for me sounds sounds like a really good you know reason to seek out coaching. Right? Yes. Specifically for me in my case is the the yeah. obstacles and preparing yes. for those. And a coach is someone that's like a hundred percent for you. Mm. I think sometimes we can have an idea and um, tell our family, and they've got their own plans and agendas, right? And same with friends or someone might not understand, you know, you want to write a book? What, what are you talking about, right? But when you have someone who's like for you, like their job is to basically just like support you and encourage you. Again, I said not not in a way that's unrealistic, but like, okay, great. How are we going to get there? Mm. And then the accountability, right? Um, I have a coach right now helping me with my nutrition. 
And she texted me the other day. It was like noon. She's like, you should be halfway through your water intake by now. You know, <laughs> But I was so glad because I went and grabbed some water. Right. right. So sometimes we just need that person who's like paying attention and listening, like truly gets it and is for us. Hmm. You know, that's um, just so helpful. So when you hit that obstacle, they're like, it's okay. You know, you got this, right? Versus you in your own head, like giving up because you hit an obstacle, mm. right? It's right. just another person cheering cheering for us. And without all the connection of ha- like being part of your family or being your spouse or being your child or something, mm. you know, because um, they've all got their own opinions. Um, but the coach is like, really, what what do you want? I want to help you get that. Right. What a what a great um, you know, bridge you just built between um, between expecting um, blockers, right, mm-hmm. and that God's plan is always the right one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, wh- I I think if I were to embrace both of those things simultaneously, yeah. life would be a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There's going to be blocks, and it doesn't mean it's not God's plan. Right. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and then the, you mentioned earlier the voice of God. Like, how do you know? Mm. You know, how do you know it's God, right? Like, sometimes we'll be like, I'm saying, you know, we talk about saying yes to God. What if I'm just saying yes to my ego, mm. right? But I think the more we study scripture, the more we are in God's word, then we recognize and hear God's voice. And are we perfect every time? No, you know. Um, I remember my husband saying, we were praying for a sign. And he's like, but what if there's a sign and we miss it? <laughs> and I just think that's so human, but I don't think God's going to let us miss it, right? And so, like I said, it comes in clarity and not chaos. You start to understand God's voice isn't one of condemnation, but it may be one of conviction, hmm. right? It is one of conviction. So, But you understand he's not going to make you feel shame, but he may convict you to say, you know, I need to repent here. Right. right, but you don't know that unless you're in His Word. But He, His Word is like the guide to all of that. And so, um, you know, it's a. I'm going to say it again, Evan. It's a practice, <laughs> um, but it's a practice of listening and reading His Word, and and then really just kind of honing that um, patience. Because I think, like I said, even earlier with the book, I want it and I want it now. And I think sometimes God's like, his answer isn't no, it's just not yet, mm-hmm. right? And so that patience piece is, I think, difficult for a lot of us, especially if we're doers and we are, you know, excited about new things. We want to do it right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and, and I, I, I appreciate this has been a, a personal coaching session, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm getting this for free, so yes. thank you. Um, so um, so how do you... How do you then measure your impact? Uh, you yeah. know, as you know, because you're 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 influential in several different ways in several different arenas, right? You've yeah. had impact on people's people's lives in in a lot of different arenas. How do you how do you measure that and 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 kind of say, okay, well, I've made a noticeable, meaningful change here. This is the arena I operate well in. You know, what's next? Can, can you tell me? Yeah. Can we bring on the journey a little bit? Yeah. So um, as I've gotten older, this has changed. I think I've gotten. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm wise, but I'm wiser than I was. And um, I think when I think of influence, I believe everyone has influence and impact, right? Mm. Clearly, we all have people that God's put in our lives. And so I think I used to want to be, um, like have more followers on Instagram or, you know, talk on bigger stages, that kind of thing. Um, and now what I recognize is the people that are closest to me is really who God's called me to have that real influence and impact on. May He may call me to more, and I think He has in certain arenas, but it's no longer about that. Hmm. It's more about how am I showing up for real in my life and even noticing my clients, where they're coming from. Um, I used to think I was going to get all these clients if I like went viral on social media. Hmm. That's actually not how it's happened they're coming to me because they know me or they know someone that i know Mm. and so i've realized what makes a difference is the conversations you're having in your real life um and just kind of (laughs) believe it or not what you're doing in your quiet time Mm. what you're doing in your marriage 
right. what you're doing in your parenting, what you're doing in your friendships. I think um, that's real, where the real legacy lies. I think I loved writing the book and having it published because I do think that's a really cool, tangible legacy for my kids. Um, it's a story yeah. of faith and their mom's life. And I think when you know your parent in that way, it's there's something super powerful about that. Um, so they have that. So I love that. My hope for the book was always that it would honor God and that it would encourage people. And mm -hmm. so when people text me or DM me and tell me, or if you're telling me a story about how this encouraged you, that feels like impact to me. Like that feels like really positive influence. Um, you know, I, I just think one by one, <laughs> I mean, even if it's an audience of one, if one person reads this and maybe they've never opened the Bible before, and I quote scripture in there several times, if they um, say, huh, I didn't know the Bible said that, and they actually open their Bible, <laughs> praise God, <laughs> right? Yeah. So for me, it's it's as I've gotten older, I understand influence as maybe it seems worldly smaller, but it's actually much greater um, in the long run. That's neat, um, and and I think you kind of answered my 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 next question for the most part because you, you defined kind of who your current reach is. Um, is there is there any is there any arena or, or group of folks that you, where, where you kind of hope to grow? I think you also alluded to it. People maybe haven't haven't read their Bible, right? And yeah. it might be. Is, is is there any is there are there any other folks that are kind of on your mind or on your heart where you want to see an impact? So I have a real heart for people who were raised in church but never heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I have a real heart for people who go to church every week and still don't feel a personal relationship with Jesus. Um, not from a judgment perspective, but just from I want them to hear the good news and I want them to have the relief that comes with knowing it's not mm -hmm. based on their performance. Um, and so I have that. I, I heard someone say the other day that they have a heart for the overprivileged, which I think sometimes <laughs> I do too. I'm like, I think it's hard. You know, I think when you're in need, it's easier to come to Christ from a place of uh, desperation. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have everything, the comforts of the world, that's real difficult. And so um, I just want to reach people who maybe don't know um, that they can have that freedom that comes from believing in Jesus. It's, I think religion has taught a lot of us um, that it's up to us. Mm -hmm. And that pressure is absolutely unbearable. And it's not, you could never earn your way into heaven. So we, we are lucky and blessed that Jesus did that for us. And so just sharing that with people. Um, yeah, I love, I love the person who maybe likes me or likes my stories. And then God gets in there somehow through that. I hope that it could be a conduit for people um, to find Jesus. I mean, that would be um, the best thing that I could do, the best legacy that I could have. Fantastic. Well, I, I guess I, I guess my question wasn't answered before. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, uh, and uh, we'll be right back. All right, welcome back. I still have Sue Bidstrip here with me. She hasn't left, and uh, thank goodness because I got so many more questions. <laughs> Sue, thanks for sticking with us. Um, so I want to get a little bit into um, you know what this you know podcast is is about, and that's about legacy, right? Defining. Uh, you know what the what the meaningful impact is that that you know you are hoping to make or that you you know you are making um, and and you know what what is remaining of that right what where do you hope to go next and so I'd love to understand kind of how you're leveraging a uh, great big yes you know the the, the book the the movement uh, towards uh, towards making a meaningful a lasting impact. You mentioned your kids, yeah, right, and that's and and to leave them with your voice. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, what where do you hope that it goes from here? Well, I think one of the things that's come out of the book that's so fun for me is I've been asked to speak at different things. So mm -hmm. I went and spoke at a mom's group, um, moms of minis, and um, they're at the beginning of their journey, right? And like I said, I don't call myself wise, but I'm wiser, and so there's <laughs> things that I kind of wish that I would have known or um, just that I got to stand up in front of them and say, you're doing great, you mm -hmm. know, and just give them that encouragement. So I love 
that as a legacy that I could make people feel encouraged. Mm. Um, also that they can see me as an example and see what's possible. So if I'm following what I th think God wants me to do and kind of stepping out of my comfort zone, that that would encourage other people to do that as well. Um, and as well as how to listen for God's voice and how to say yes to that. Um, and just kind of how to have that faith throughout your life, whether it's parenting or now I'm going to be going and speaking at a women's group. It's called Encore and it's for women in midlife, which is me. Um, and kind of how this is our best chapter coming up, right? Mm. And so I get to encourage people to say yes to God now. It's not, you know, he's not finished with us, right? right? There's, as long as you're breathing, God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And so getting to speak to people and encourage them, um, you know, a lot of times people are, they don't like public speaking and I have not met a microphone I don't like. So <laughs> I, that to me has been such a gift because it's just um, been fun, you know, to be like, people say, do you want to come talk? And I'm like, yes, I do. And then, you know, if I get them laughing, then I really feel successful. So that's fun. Awesome. <laughs> um, and so w when we talk about legacy, we, we talk about, you know, the, the, the future hopes that we have. Um, and and all, some of the kind of dividing lines are, you know, legacies we want to make. And then, of course, legacies we want to break. And when we talk about legacies we want to break, we've talked about, you know, with, with other guests, we've talked about chronic homelessness and, and human trafficking and things like that. And things that have been handed to us from childhood. You know, I had personal situations in my life. That was a big part of my story was was dealing with, you know, forgiveness, right? And and and, and breaking the legacy of fatherless homes, right? That, that's what I wanted for myself and that's kind of what I stand on. For great big yes or even or for you personally, you know, are there are there situations or or or, or pieces of your life that have been handed to you that you've been actively a part of breaking, ending or or helping others yeah, do so? Yeah. That's Fun to talk about. Yes, absolutely. Um, so sex trafficking really bothers me. I learned about it, um, gosh, I don't know, like seven probably years ago, really for sure. When we moved to Texas nine years ago, and then we had someone come speak at our church about it, and she was a survivor. And I just remember sitting there in church and feeling like that um, Holy Spirit feeling where you're like, I have to do something, right? Mm -hmm. Like your body is just like, and um, so anyway, I ended up contacting um, the woman who was starting the refuge and I ended up teaching yoga out there to survivors of sex trafficking, which was um, hard, but also um, it felt like a full circle moment because in order to do that, I took some um, classes on how to teach trauma sensitive yoga and when I went through the, the classes, I realized, because I had trauma when I was in my 20s, I was held up at gunpoint. And so I suffered from PTSD, and that's all in the book. But it talk, I, I talk about how God brought that full circle. So 25 years later, I feel called by the Holy Spirit to um, reach out and see how I can help. And it came up that I could teach yoga there, took a class about trauma-sensitive yoga, learned about what trauma does to our body, mm. um, and sat there realizing God orchestrated um, this kind of redemption of what I went through. And, and you know, it says in scripture that um, he'll comfort you in your afflictions, and then he may ask you to comfort other people, that you would understand what they're going through and you could comfort them. And so I felt like that was really a full circle moment because that fear and that PTSD and that um, trauma, that the way that your body, that fight or flight or freeze, right? Like the way that your body responds um, is something that's so powerful. And I don't think in the world we talk about it that much. And I think a lot of times we try to, um, I'm fine, I'm fine. There's nothing to see here. Um, and I think that experience, like he, he made me weep for this thing. And then within that thing, he also brought me more healing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that he just continues to do that, right? When he calls us for something, you know, like I said, that feeling, I have to do something. Um, but at the time, I remember people weren't talking about sex trafficking as much. And that was only like seven or eight years ago. And I feel like now it's come more to the forefront. And I'm so glad to know that there's more and more people fighting against it and everything. Um, but it continues, it continues to break my heart. For sure. Um, in in the everyday, what I, I really want to help people overcome is, and, and it is related, but um, 
not perfectly related, but fear, just fear. Mm -hmm. Fear that I won't have enough. Fear that um, I'm not loved. Fear that I don't have a purpose. Fear that I won't get what I want. Fear, fear, fear. I think, um, you know, my kids now are 26, 24, and 21. And um, their generation has a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel called to um, speak against that fear in the way that I can offer God's hope, right? right? And so um, we're not people that are um, victims. We're people that are victorious, right? So we look at, if we can look at life through the lens of what's possible instead of what might go wrong, Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really powerful. So I think not that they're unrelated, but I do think um, fear in general and just kind of that anxiety that a lot of the new, the younger people feel. Um, I think I felt all of that for a reason so that God could bring me through it and then I could help people, um, not me, because I can't help people overcome fear, but I can offer them God who can help them overcome fear. And so that's always on my heart. Like when I hear somebody that feels really um, down and despondent mm-hmm. and hopeless, um, I want to speak into that with hope and light and love and joy. Yeah, yeah. Um, something you mentioned too uh, when you talk about uh, uh, the the Holy Spirit moving and you you felt you felt called into action, right? And um, you know, one of the sayings that I love, and um, one of our folks on the podcast here. Uh, reminded me of this that you know God doesn't call the equipped; He equips the called, right? And and I, sure. I, I just that that is that's uh, that's come up so many times since she told me that. <laughs> and isn't that so good for people to hear again and again? Because often we might sit there in the crowd and we might feel that, hmm. and we say, "But I'm unqualified." But it he's not he's not calling you because you're qualified. He's right. qualified, right? Right. You know, he'll equip you. And I think that faith and trust of just taking that next step, again, action's going to bring clarity. Just make the phone call. Hmm. I, I was in church and I felt like I needed to say something, you know, and then maybe, it, and God will just help you along with each step. But I think a lot of times our in our humanness, we just decide we're unqualified and then we don't don't make that call or we don't step forward. Sometimes hmm. God's just asking you to walk across the street and meet your neighbor. Hmm. And we're like, eh, that's weird. Right. Right. And so that he's not calling you because you're so great at this. <laughs> he's he's going to equip you for what he calls you into. Yeah. I say, right. Like, it's it's not weird for me to meet my neighbor because I mean, everybody <laughs> around here no, no, knows me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll. Um, something that, that you mentioned, you know, about not being equipped. Right. I mean, yeah, Moses, Mary, the disciples. I mean, you know, none of them. none of the heroes right of the Bible <laughs> were, you know, besides Jesus himself were, yeah. were equipped or, or, or were yeah. uh, ready for what they took on. Um, there's something else that you that you also mentioned that I wanted to zoom in on. Um, and I, I can't recall it. So That's I'm going right. to cut It'll that out. And we're going to skip it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Oh man, that's a bummer. Oh well, that's what the cut button's for. Um, so, all right, mo- moving on then. Um, so that said, um, looking back at so, you know, you mentioned, um, for example, the, you, the this generation, you know, your your kids, yeah. and, and um, kind of constantly being in the f- fight or flight, yes, you know, position. You know, we, we I feel like. Uh, in my experience, you know, the younger generations, and that includes my my own, you know, it's it's clenched fists and tight shoulders. Like, how do you how do you breathe through yes. something if you're in this position all mm-hmm. the time? Um, and um, and so I, I I think that rings very true. How do you how do you speak peace into somebody and 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 um, lead somebody to a place of of of, of rest, right? Yeah. And, and, and being able to receive right. uh, truth. Right. Well, I think too, for, for you to say, I think our kids or my kids, or our younger generations understand that um, it's experiential. So there's experiential therapy. There's experiential um, ways of meeting God. Like I said, when you're walking, when you're running, when you're in the park, when you're 
grounding with your feet down in the grass and you're like, whoa, like this is amazing creation, right? Mm. Um, and I think our kids understand that. And I think it's harder, I think in our generation, I'm going to speak for myself, I'm 54. So in my generation, your parents just said, believe in God, this is the way it is, just because I said so, <laughs> right? Um, that's not flying anymore, just right. hands up. Um, and so I think um, allowing them to experience and God is everywhere, right? Omnipresent. And so especially in nature and and even in their own bodies as they move and breathe. And that's why the breath is so important. I talk about breath a lot. I do breath meditations with people a lot because God breathed life into us. And so I believe if you don't know what to pray, if you don't know what to do, just breathe. Mm. It's like a prayer in itself, right? Because you are connecting to your source um, you wouldn't have breath if it wasn't for him. So believe or don't believe, it's not a mind thing at that point. It's a body thing. And so once you start to breathe, then you start to think clearly, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's when you're in that fight or flight, you're not able to think. And I learned um, early on when I would have those instances of just kind of a panic attack of just sitting and breathing and how spiritual that really is. Mm -hmm. It's practical, um, but it's very spiritual, and God is in each breath. So I think teaching our kids about all of that, along with also believe in God, but here's scripture and all of that, but they might come to that later, but if they learn just to be still and breathe, I trust God's in there. Hmm. I trust he's got them in that, right? Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. I just want to talk about breath, I guess. It does. <laughs> I, I, it's, I think it's... Um, I think it's... it's it's fascinating to me how much scripture, uh, you know, again talks about breath and yes. meditation, yes, and, it does, and uh, and being still, yes. and, uh, and 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 yet it it feels like at some point it kind of got divorced from the church. Yes, it started um, to be about doing mm -hmm. instead of being, mm -hmm. and the truth is, we don't work ourselves into heaven. We surrender <laughs> right and so it's so countercultural. so you could see where it got lost yeah yeah absolutely um i'm so glad you you brought it up um today so thanks for going down that rabbit trail yeah. <laughs> um so uh stepping a shifting gears just a little bit i wanted to talk about influences people that yeah. influenced you in the past you know whether that be with 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 writing or or stepping out into into uh coaching or just even stepping out and 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 not being equipped. Yeah. Right. Can you can you tell me a little bit about some of your influences that, yeah. that you've had? Yeah. So um, for sure, my parents. You know, um, I talk about them a lot in the book, but um, so positive. You know, and just um, loving and encouraging. And so I think I just come by that through them. Um, happy people, joyful people, and I think um, my mom was you know, such a Jesus lover her whole life, but it never felt like she was clutching her pearls mm. and telling me what I was doing wrong. Um, but she just, um, there was, there was discipline, but it wasn't, <laughs> um, there was no shame. It was about love. And I think that that's key. So my parents, um, I actually thought about the writers, um, because I think that's an important conversation. I think what's interesting that God does is, he gives us things we're attracted to, right? Like music that we like or books that we like um, that can influence us. Like we have our own personalities and God uses all of that. And so there's a lot of women my age who write books about God and um, those don't appeal to me at all. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I love books that are written by like priests mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and contemplatives. Like they went and they were like living in the forest or whatever. Like I like... Um, you know, I love Henry Nowen. I like Richard Rohr. Um, my favorite is Brennan Manning. He wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. And that book is everything. I mean, that book is the gospel. Like, he, you know, he's sh sharing the gospel, but he's also appealing to – I heard a, a pastor say once – he was upstairs at church, and then after church, he went downstairs to the AA meeting, and he mm. said, and he realized downstairs is where church was really happening. Wow. And I love that because it's when you get real that God, you know, is most there because you need him. You have a desperate dependence on him. And so 
Brennan Manning taught me that. And I give that book to everybody. I talk about that book all the time because he said one of his quotes is, and it's not in that book, it's in a different book, but he says, you should define yourself as someone who is radically loved by God Hmm. because every other identity is an illusion. (laughs) If we get that, Hmm. you are radically loved by God. That's your identity. And if you start there, anything's possible. And you don't have to have the fear because you have someone to trust, right? So, um, but the other thing I wanted to mention when you had asked me in advance about influences, I was ta- I was thinking, I really like funny writers. Um, I love Anne Lamott. I think she's hilarious and um, she's irreverent at times. Um, <laughs> and I think it's funny. Um, I like Anna Quinlan. She's kind of like me in the way that she writes little essays. She's not uh, faith-based at all, but she's funny and she can see the funniness in like family situations and things like that. Um, there was a book uh, my mom had on her shelf and it was by a woman named Marjorie Holmes. And it's out of print, but um, she it was called Lord Let Me Love. And it was little poems, like an, a little tiny, not even an essay, like a paragraph, like a little poem. And I remember one of them was Let Them Remember the Laughter. And it was all about, let my children remember the laughter. And I know they're going to remember the discipline. And I know they're going to remember the struggles. And I know they're going to remember the fights. But please, Lord, let them remember the laughter. And I was a young girl when I read that. And I remember that um, because my mom had marked it up. She had starred it, right? Like that was one of her pages that she loved. And and I do remember her. I, she's still with us, praise God. But I she laughed and we had fun. Mm. And so for me, that became kind of a guiding principle of, yes, we have to do all the things to parent, but we also are here to love and have fun and have joy. So Marjorie Holmes um, was an influence. I actually looked her up and I can get the book. Somebody has it and it's like expensive, but you could still get it from, I'm, I'm thinking about doing it. Um, but yeah, so I like humor. Um, because I really do think there's this balance. And I think sometimes, and I have already mentioned it, but I think sometimes when we talk about God, we can get real, real, real serious. Mm-hmm. And I don't want us to forget that um, joy is one of the gifts that he gives us, you know, and um, peace for sure and hope, you know, always have hope. So, um, you know, it's cliche to say Jesus is my, I, I, you know, he's helped me along the way, but really, truly has. But I think he's given a gift of writing to so many people that have also helped me along the way. And the different trainings that I've taken, there's always been Christian writers that I've been reading that are really good. It's just kind of interesting that a lot of them turn out to be um, men and priests. Mm. And, you know, I think sometimes I look to the past sometimes for writers, because I think today, in today's day and age, there's a lot of like quick hits, like a tweet tweetable thing that they're writing or they're trying to go viral or they're trying to sell or they're trying to be um antagonistic in a way and um or um i don't know it it just doesn't feel as thoughtful Hmm. the more recent things so i hope my book feels thoughtful well it's it's interesting that you draw a lot of your inspiration from men because again as a man reading your book (laughs) i'm I'm, you know i'm enjoying it so that's uh well i also grew up with only brothers (laughs) And um, I was really close to my dad. And, you know, so I, I kind of have that sensibility about me sometimes. It's, you know, I don't love to go into like, um, I don't know. I just, I, I can't even explain why. But my point to at the beginning when I was talking about that is that I do believe that those are clues. God leads us to certain writers, right? When you feel like, oh, I should, you know, read that or I should listen to this podcast or whatever it is, um, follow those nudges. Um, God probably has something for you there, right? Awesome. Um, I love it. You know, and, and you mentioned um, you mentioned a lot of the your your writing influences. What about what about champions for for causes? Right. I mean, you have you have you displayed yourself as a, as a champion uh, of uh, saying yes, right? Yeah. And pursuing. Yeah. Are there any are there any influences there in that in that arena? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for sure. I mean, when I see women business owners who are like killing it, like <laughs> the lady who made Spanx, now I can't think of her name, <laughs> but I'll see something she's saying. I'm like, yeah, like she saw a need in the market and just like created it. <laughs> I think that's so cool. Um, I just think anytime you're saying yes and you're following that dream, whatever that dream 
is. So it could be in business. It could be something creative. Um, I love seeing creative people put their work out. I love songwriters. I mean, that's like a big, huge thing for me, especially now living in Austin. We go to a lot of concerts and um, I just love songwriters. There's a new songwriter, Noah Khan. He's Mm. like 26 years old. My daughter told me about him. And then I ended up, we had tickets to see him at the ACL taping and and I was watching, we were on the side and watching him singing to this crowd of kids in their 20s and they knew every word. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about mental illness. He's talking about fear. He's talking about leaving home. He's talking about all of these things. And I said to my daughter, he's, um, he was chosen for this time, for you people. And he wrote what was real to him and that's why it's resonating. Right. So anyone that's real to me is so inspirational and courageous because I think it's easier to try to fit a mold and be like, oh, well, I'll just write a song, you know, go be in a boy band or something. No, he's <laughs> not that guy. Right. So when you're authentically completely yourself, I think that's amazing. And I think it's getting rarer and rarer. Um, but when you see it, you know it. And you're like, oh, that's so special. Right. Yeah. I think that's why I, I uh, drawn to like artists like Ben Rector, who was playing it. Uh, the wife and I are going to go see him this yes. week uh, at ACL, also. Awesome. And, uh, um, you know, d- dudes in their in their you know mid to late thirties that yeah. are uh, you know finally hitting some sense of normalcy in life. Yes. And, you know, which is to to me, you know, uh, normal and steady was very abnormal from how I you know grew oh, up and lived life, right? Yes. And so, so changing gears and people that can kind of speak to that. Yes, I cool. love it. And I mean, there's so many um, people like that make movies. When you make an independent movie and it's so good and you're like, whoa. But mm-hmm. you know that person's probably not going to get all the accolades. They're not going to get an Academy Award or whatever. But it's so important that they keep making those movies. And I was, you know, paying attention to the writer's strike and the Hollywood strike and all of that because I think it's so interesting about the AI and how they're going to allow certain AI into things and they're going to be able to put actors in when they're not even there and they're going to be able to – they don't even need writers in certain cases. And I think that's so sad Mm -hmm. um, because it's all about like each of us has something really important and unique to contribute. Mm -hmm. And so – I think that's what inspires me is when I see somebody doing that, whatever the arena is, and kind of saying, you know, whatever to, I need to go viral on TikTok. Right. You know, right. that's just really scaring me a little bit that like, you know, to sell my book, maybe I could sell more, Evan, if I danced a dance on TikTok, but that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> um, so I did want to do the couples dance that Beckham was doing with his wife to um, mm-hmm. Islands in the Stream, but Jeff would not do it. So <laughs> you can imagine. Um, no. So yeah, you know, every once in a while, I'm tempted to kind of get in there with the crowd, but then I realize that's not really me. And mm-hmm. so I think being who you are is the most inspirational thing always, but especially now. It's awesome. We should be having somebody here on in the, in the next couple of weeks to talk about the writer's track a little bit more. Oh, too. good. So excited to excited. kind of dig into that too. Um, so I think the last last couple of questions here that I like to ask one one is really around failure um, because I do think you know and I, I think you share this mm-hmm. believe it, I know you do uh, how important failure is to to success and how how important failure is to developing and growing were there areas that you know business wise or not that you feel like were significant. Um, times of failure in your life or, or, or having to complete, complete change gears? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't believe there's failure. It's just learning. Okay. So I think that um, it depends how you look at it, right? And so I think that according to certain metrics, things might be considered a failure, but then I realized that just helped me get to the next thing, right? Sure. And so um, we could just start most recently with the book, thinking that I need to have a traditional publisher and then not getting a traditional publisher. Some people might say was a failure. I look back now and I go, oh, that was all part of the process. Mm. Um, Because every single one was like, you're a great writer. You should keep writing. I just can't have you because you don't have a high enough Instagram following. That to me is like disappointing. That's Mm. not failure. That's like learning. I learned a lot. And it's growth because I'm like, okay, well, I still want to do this. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it depends, right? It depends how you look at it. But I do know that every step of the way, um, it taught me something. I think personally, I think um, being a parent of kids in their 20s, you could really be hard on yourself looking back and saying, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. And I think that's okay. But I think that um, considering something a failure is not helpful. Because the truth is when you look back and you say, oh, I could have done it differently. So go forward and do it differently. <laughs> right? So there's never got, like I said, every time you wake up with breath in your lungs, there's a purpose and a plan for your life. So if you're looking back and saying, I failed as a parent or I failed in that marriage or I failed um, at the job or I failed with the podcast or I failed, whatever it is that you're doing, um, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. If you look at it as I, I learned, I that didn't turn out as I planned, <laughs> but I learned this. And so moving forward, I'm going to do this. I think that's going to be a, a much better way of looking at it. Mm. And it's... You know, I'm just designed to talk this way, be positive, and I'm a coach. So I I truly do see it that way because, mm-hmm. um, like I said, I could have taken to my bed and, like, decided I shouldn't write a book, but it's – I just – I just can't. <laughs> like, that's mm-hmm. just not in me. So I think for um, people to just change their perspective on what that means mm-hmm. is really powerful. It's empowering because you haven't failed because you're not done yet. Hmm. Right? Right. I mean, you've got another chance. So do it again. Do it again. Do it differently. Do it better. It doesn't matter if your kids are 50. Hmm. And if you felt like you didn't have a great experience with them or you didn't do this right, quote, um, then go do it differently Hmm. today. Like start today. And so I think, um, yeah, failure is an interesting topic because I think it's important for growth. But I also don't think... It can stop you. It can't stop right. you. Don't let it stop. Right. Don't let it stop you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And and I I I, I like the the word failure because it, it for for me it's, it's it's one of my favorite f words. <laughs> uh, it's among them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know I I I enjoy. Uh, I enjoy failure, you know, when it comes to working out, you know, hit, hit, hit your failure point, oh, right? Oh, yeah, good or one. Or when it comes to, um, you know, when, it, when it's come to, you know, building the podcast, oh, hang on, that that method failed, this didn't work, how can I do it better, how can I, you know, put in a plan B so this doesn't happen again, yes. right? And so I, I do think that I, I personally um, relish in the idea of failure because that means that I tried hard enough or went hard enough in a direction yes. where there was no more no further to go in that specific direction. I love right? it. Um, so, That's but, good. But I love your perspective. Maybe I need to work on balancing that word a little bit better. I like that, the <laughs> failure of your muscles, because I'm doing that now too, because my trainer told me I need to lift heavy things. <laughs> um, and so she's like, you want it to go to failure. Like, you know, um, that's a good perspective. Because you're right. You, I've gone as far as I can with that. Hmm. You know, I mean, that's that's learning. Right. That's great. Well, I've gone as far as I can go with that today, right? Today. That's, that's muscle failure. Right? Yeah. I'm going to pick it up next time. Yeah. Do the same thing. <laughs> yes. And it's building. Right. So basically, when you failed, you've built. Right. And then you go back and you build more. And that's, I mean, I think some people will be like, you know, and you can tell people who are like, well, how much money did you make on that? Or how many books did you sell? Or how much, how many people listen to your podcast? Or how many followers do you have? And they're very focused on like those numbers. And um, I just learned that those numbers don't mean anything. I know people who have gone viral and who have so many followers on these things and they're not doing any business. Just because you have a lot of followers on something doesn't mean you have a business. Hmm. So I think understanding what failure means to you because somebody might say you're a failure, and you may have a completely different definition of that. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, the last thing that I'll that I'll, I'll ask you, you know, um, since since you mentioned, you know, uh, books, are are there any books that you're hoping or thinking about or already starting to to, to work on publishing in the future? Oh, I love that. Um, I definitely know that this is these stories. This book is very. Um, it's like the beginning. Hmm. It's very curious when you're writing your own story how careful you need to be that you're not telling someone else's story. Mm-hmm. And so um, God has done a great work in me with adult children. But I'm not ready to write that story yet because it's not really my story yet. I see. 
Do you know what I mean? I do. But I think that there's more. But I'll know when it when it's time because I'll feel that from the Lord. I think because I don't feel that it's time to write anything else right now. Hmm. Um, I feel really called to just kind of live it and be in it and um, be with my people and and kind of celebrate hmm. what I've done and what I've accomplished and that I had set out to do and that God had called me to do, and then just kind of wait for what's next. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that answer. Um, you know, I here I was going to try to help you sell the next book, but you know. no, I, I'll no, come I, on I, next time. Uh, by the way, I I am the one that asked Sue, and she, you know, she gave me a great big yes. She didn't, you know, approach me about this. I was yeah. so excited again when I started reading this, and I was like, I've got to, I've got to pick your Thank brain. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, and uh, again, you can follow Sue at uh, her handle at Great Big Yes uh, and at uh, GreatBigYes dot com. Yes. And I just want to just extend, you know, a huge thank you for your time, uh, for, for being you. present with me, for uh, taking taking me on a journey, Yeah, a little bit of coaching as well. It's fun. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. And I love that you're doing this. I think this is so fun. I love your topic and the people that you're having on. I think it's so exciting and I can't wait to see it grow and listen to more episodes and yeah, learn from you. Well, if it wasn't for the people I'm having on, nobody would listen to this. <laughs> Just you talking. <laughs> Let's face it. Um, <laughs> they're here for the guests, and I am too. Well, uh, thanks again, and until next time. This is Accessor. Accessor.